Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's my first time doing a video conference, so this is going to be interesting, to say the least. Um, but from our point, um, <laughs> just the first, some admin out of the way. I know the email that came out said, um, Prof Warren Brittany, and maybe one day that will be my title, but as it stands, it's still Mr. And um, come April 8th, it'll be doctor, but it's not quite prof just yet. Um, I'm just getting a lot of noise in my headphones. All right. Okay, so let's get started. Efficiency analysis of uh, water service provision and electricity service provision. This is some of the studies that myself and some of my students have undertaken um, in the last few years. And we identified these as the most important services, at least in this part, in, at this time in South Africa's history, to have a look at. But with the electricity crisis a couple of years ago and with our water crisis, we decided to just go and use some econometric techniques to try and analyze the efficiency of our water service provision and our electricity distribution by municipalities. Um, so a brief outline of my of my presentation is provided here. I'm just going to introduce you to what efficiency analysis is, just in general. And then there are two main techniques of estimating uh, a frontier, and we'll get to that, but there it's non-parametric and parametric estimation. Then we're going to look at the two case studies of interest, which are water services and electricity distribution. Uh, we've done a couple more. We did universities as well, but that's not included in this particular uh, presentation. So let's jump right in. I'm just going to turn you down if that's all right, because it's, it's quite loud in my headphones. All right, so, so we're going to start with an introduction to efficiency analysis. Um, essentially, what we've got is we've got firms that take inputs and create outputs. Now, whether we do, whether we create tons of outputs and use tons of inputs or whatever, this, our output needs to be accompanied by a minimal use of, of inputs. So that will maximize our profits, it will maximize our services. So we need to target maximum production for minimum input. And that is typical of any firm or hopefully a government department. And some of the, the most elementary way of thinking of efficiency is the ratio of output to input. How much output am I producing for each unit of input that I'm using? So uh, we're going to call our municipalities producers. They're now developing or providing some sort of good or service, and they, and they require inputs to do this. And you can look at an efficiency in two ways. Firstly, is the input orientation. Now, the in, uh, sorry, the output orientation. I'm going to move over this one because we focus on the on the input orientation. The output orientation. Basically, you've given a set of inputs, you're given a set of funds or resources, and you'll try and maximise the amount of outputs that are generated from that fixed set of inputs. Now, as you know. Um, water and electricity service provision doesn't really fit that mold. That's where input orientation comes in. Basically, electricity, you have to supply a certain amount of electricity to the, to the grid or to your consumers. The same thing with water. You have to hit a certain amount of water to a certain number of households. <coughs> and you want to minimize the amount of inputs that you use to achieve this uh, this output. So you've got a fixed output or fixed or predetermined output. You need to d deliver this much water to the to your constituents and to your consumers. But we're going to try and minimise that. We can't go and just pump more water into the system and and because <coughs> that's not going to go anywhere. So we need to minimise our inputs uh, uh, for some predetermined level of output. So what we're looking at now. We're going to be focusing on for the remainder of this talk is the input orientation, second version there. So we want the amount of inputs used to achieve a desired level of output. All right, some math. 
I'm going to keep it light today. Uh, it's a Friday. I believe Fridays are days taking it a bit easier. So I'm not going to go into all the technicalities of the stuff that I've done. I'll try and explain it as best as I can without putting too many equations and mathematical symbols up. Firstly, we, we need to describe the production set. And it can be described, as you can see over here. Basically, it's a set of all inputs x and outputs y. So inputs are denoted x, outputs are denoted y. And it's a set of all feasible combinations of inputs and outputs. Essentially, what we're saying is that this, if I use x inputs, I can feasibly obtain y outputs. That's all it's saying. It's, it's within the realms of possibility to achieve that amount of output. So once we define our set of physically obtainable points, what's feasible and what's possible, then we need to go and find the frontier of that set. And the frontier is defined in two ways for each orientation. For the input orientation, we'll have a fixed level of output Y. And we need to now go and find um, those inputs or the, the boundary of that production set such that the minute I contract my input to some value theta, the theta is between 0 and 1. If I contract my inputs, so reduce my inputs, I, this set no longer forms part of the production set, use, meaning if I contract my inputs by some value theta, I cannot feasibly reduce the output Y. And that, that identifies the boundary of the production function in the input, oh, sorry, the production set in the in the input orientation. For the output orientation, if I've got a set of inputs, I want to know how much can I, how much output can I eke out of these inputs, and if I can't eke any more out, um, or if, or if I make the output bigger, they become physically impossible to uh, produce lambda y outputs from x inputs, then, then we're on the, in the, on the production frontier. And that's obviously where lambda is bigger than 1. So an input-output pair, x, y, is considered technically efficient or efficient if it falls on that production frontier. So if it falls within this characteristic or in this, we've now got an efficient combination of inputs and outputs. So to measure, we've got to use that definition of the production frontier because we've got to compare all our all our observations to that frontier to try and determine their efficiency. And the de Broglie-Forel measure of is the most common one, and that's one we're going to be using. And it's simply defined as the influence of all values of theta such that I can contract my inputs. These for the input orientation. I can contract my inputs while maintaining a fixed set of outputs and still, still retain the production set. So if this value theta, um, goes between 0 and 1, if this value can't be contracted any further than theta 1, it means that my, my input-output pair is efficient. So in that case, a theta value of 1 would indicate efficient, and theta value less than 1 would indicate inefficient, which, or, or yes, which means I can compromise and maintain the, the given level of output. In terms of the output maximization, about this in general, because we're not going to focus on this, but it's, it's essentially how much, can, how much output can I pull out of this set of inputs while maintaining um, feasibility or practical, uh, a practical amount of output from a given input. So how much can I expand my, for my given inputs? Once again, if this lambda, if the supremum or the maximum value of this lambda is 1, now, then that input-output combination is efficient. And if it's greater than 1, then it's inefficient. But we'll be focusing on this definition of efficiency because we'll be looking at the, at the input orientation. Graphically, the input orientation can be seen as follows. For two inputs, x1 and x2, and we've got one fixed output, so y is equal to 1, so unity. This over here is my output. So any x, y, x1, x2, and y combination, y is equal to 1, it's fixed. These are all the values of x1 and x2 that can produce 
an output output value of one. They fall in this set over here, bus psi. Delta psi over here is the line segment AB, and that would be denote my production frontier. So the edge of the of the produ production set. So any input combination x1 and x2 is efficient in producing one unit of output if it falls on this line segment AB in that on that production frontier. So if I look at a simple way of defining efficiencies, if I look at this xj value somewhere in the production set, the efficiency is how much can I radially contract this xj value so that it falls on my on my production frontier. So the efficiency would essentially be measured as OP over OXJ, so the ratio of that uh, line segment to the full line segment uh, between O and XJ. So we need ways of estimating this. And there are two main ways of doing it. The first of which is non-parametric estimation. This was, um, and then we'll look at parametric a little later. Non-parametric estimation of delta psi, so the production frontier. So that's where the problem comes in. In this example over here, we, we've assumed that we know the production frontier, but in all, for all intents and purposes, we don't, and we need to estimate that frontier. And these are the two ways, to, or the two most common ways of doing it. Firstly, the non-parametric estimation. It was developed by Charles et al., Charles Cooper wrote, and in 1978, and it's a non-parametric approach, so it, there's no assumptions on the functional form of that production frontier. So we make no assumptions about what it looks like, we just use the data to go and piece that together. The method of DEA, or dot development analysis, uh, constructs a piecewise linear quasi-convex hull around the data points, and that's as per green, and um, this forms the... And it does this using programming and optimization techniques, and this is how the efficiencies are determined. And the most uh, pro of this, at least when it was developed, was that it can handle multiple inputs and outputs without with ease. There's, so you can have a five input, five output system without having, without having any complications arise in the model. It handles those quite easily. Um, Essentially, it creates a product, an estimate of production function by putting line segments between the values or the observations which are the most efficient according to our definition of efficiency. And then it creates that production function as that. So here's your piecewise linear quasi-convex all around the data point. And now the efficiency of this point B can now be compared to this line segment through BC to determine its efficiency, and obviously this would be some estimate of the true production frontier. The way it does this, two, two manners. The first one would be under the assumption of constant returns to scale, and then that would be the solution to these linear pro this linear program. And then the more, uh, in the literature, the more relevant one for our particular observations and investigations would be to assume variable returns to scale. And the only thing that changes now is that the lambda parameters, the lambda uh, values are constrained such that the sum of them has to equal one. And this, was, this is known as the BCCDA model, and it's used uh, very often in terms of investigations. And that's the banker Charles Cooper model. So we'll be focusing on this model for the remainder of this. Essentially, the difference between your constant returns to scale and your variable returns to scale model fixed in. What's changed here now is one input and one output. And this is um, just to simplify the, the graphic. And the constant returns to scale frontier will be would pass through that point B, and it would be the straight line, the straight dotted line over here. The, the variable return to scale um, frontier passes through all these points and creates more of a rounded frontier over there. The difference between the efficiencies is simply the difference between the line segments 
delta naught to, uh, sorry, d naught to d prime and d naught to d star. So whereas the d naught to d star, that line segment would be compared to or find the ratio to d naught to d in the constant returns of scale, whereas d naught to d prime will be uh, divided by d naught to d in the variable returns of scale. We will get this uh, frontier as our uh, we're going to estimate this variable to the frontier in our investigations. All right. There are some criticisms of EA, obviously, and the most pertinent of that is that it's a deterministic technique. It's a solution to a linear uh, programming problem. As such, it doesn't take into account any stochastic components within the variables that are measured and the estimation process. So this precludes it from traditional statistical inference. That, uh, as we as we know it, um, and furthermore, the DEA estimates are biased by construction, and I'll get to this a bit later. But it's something to to take note of that they're biased. They will always overestimate efficiencies, or they'll tend to overestimate efficiencies. And but because of the ease of its implementation, the ease of its understanding, it's gained widespread thousands of papers in which DEA has been used to assess anything from agriculture. To education. The next estimation technique is parallel frontier estimation. And the main difference behind this is that it now assumes functional form for that production function, for that production frontier, and it tries to estimate it. The original theory was developed only for the output orientated model, so production function, so we'll speak about that. The input orientation follows the form of distance functions and cost frontiers. Distance functions formed um, a portion of my thesis, but cost frontiers, what we'll be talking about, that was one of my master's students who investigated the efficiency of electricity distribution. The parametric method estimation requires the assumption of, the, of a functional form. So now, we've, now we're adding limitations or um, constraints on that on that frontier by imposing a sort of functional form onto it. The production function, denotes F, is smooth and does not necessarily pass through any of the observed points, whereas data enveloping does necessarily will pass through at least one point um, in, the, in the set. So graphically, this is what our production function looks like. If we're talking about two inputs, one output. We've got this as our production function. As you can see, it's smooth, and it doesn't pass through any of these points, uh, these observed points. The DEA frontier would obviously pass through points A, B, C, and E to form that frontier. So you could think of um, stochastic frontier analysis, which is, the, which is the name for the parametric estimate estimation of a frontier. See, now, now we're adding a stochastic component to the, to the estimation. And this considers the Taylor alpha by using k inputs, k um, x's, and the production function can be as follows. So we've got some observed output y, and that's, multiplied, that's equal to the production function using that, those inputs multiplied by some Value. Now, this value is going to be 0 and 1 because our observed output will always be less than what the production function says it should be at that point. Um, so, when you take the logs of this, you get this form of it. So, log of your outputs is equal to log of the production frontier plus some sort of error component. The way the stochastic frontier analysis differs from a traditional regression is it's in the way it handles this value, epsilon r here. But we'll get to that later after we decide what functions are we going to use in our stochastic computer analysis. So the two most typical models used in this analysis are your Cobb Douglas function, which is the first equation up here, and your translog function, which is over here. The translog function essentially just um, includes all the interaction terms for your inputs in this basic model. 
the models, um, these models obviously have been extended for the distance function and cost functions, and we'll look at those later, but we're going to assume that my production function takes this form and this form, and we're going to estimate those estimate the production function using one of these. Okay. For example, now we're looking at um, stochastic frontier analysis, and the, and the big difference between SFA and traditional regression, as I said, is the way it considers this um, epsilon, or this error term. Essentially, what it considers the error term to be composed of uh, is a VR, which is a statistical noise component, and it's got some sort of symmetric distribution with an unknown variance, sigma v. And the inefficiency component, UR, and this is further note, it's one-sided and positively skewed. Those are the assumptions of the efficiency, uh, the inefficiency distribution. A one-sided positively skewed distribution, and with which must be positive. Um, and we need to now estimate, well, the problem is now to estimate these inefficiencies, so this UR, from the residuals that we obtain. The way this is done is, um, is what will be discussed now. The underlying assumption is that firms are more likely to be efficient than or not. Than not. Now, it can be contentious, especially in public services, in that, that for the, all intents and purposes, we're going to stick to this assumption and try and estimate our firms from this. Um, the typical distributions that are used for your inefficiency term are the half normal distribution, the exponential distribution, and the truncated normal distribution. These are the ones we will consider in this, um, in this presentation, amongst others. The models are fitted using the likelihood to estimate the parameters of the model and the distributions of the error term. And the way that, that we estimate the individual efficiencies of each firm was um, devised by John Dro et al., JLMS um, estimator. Essentially, before, before John Dro et al. came along to, and devised this method of finding individual specific efficiencies, um, all that SFA could identify was average inefficiency group of, of producers. Now, this revolutionized it to a certain extent that we can actually now go and identify particular um, inefficiencies for particular firms or producers or municipalities. And the way they do it is by finding the expected value of the conditional distribution of uh, the inefficiency term given our observed residual. And the efficiency estimate, remember the UR as inefficiency, the efficiency estimate is simply found using this formula down here um, of the expected value. Okay, so that's how we went about going and uh, determining the efficiency in the stochastic frontier analysis. But there are some drawbacks to it. The one that I've uh, found in the one that I um, experienced in my own study was that the skewness requirement of the composed error term is quite um, strict in that if, this, if the error term doesn't have the right skewness, the efficiencies cannot be estimated. And because we're considering there to be a positively skewed um, distribution in your inefficiency term and a symmetric distribution in your for your random noise component, when you add them together, some sort of uh, negative skewness coming out there. And if there's no none of that in the observed in the in the residuals, then you can't go and extract the inefficiency component and estimate the inefficiency distribution, which becomes problematic, and then throws up errors. And the ways to get around this can be quite tricky, and often it it might not even be possible. That would be the one drawback, and the second one is that you have to decide on a functional form. Firstly, for the production function, you need to say, okay, well, this is the this is the production function that I'm using, and you also need to go and decide on an inefficiency distribution, so a normal, truncated normal, a gamma, 
um, the wobble, you need to go inside that forehand and then fit it and then try and figure out um, whether that was correct or not. So, you, so you're making uh, assumptions based on maybe your knowledge of this process, but not from any empirical evidence. All right, so let's go look at some case studies. The first case study is water services. And each, in each of these case studies, I'm going to show you, I'm going to present the original on top of that. We're going to uh, look at some extensions of the basic. So, for water services, this was my study. We used DPA to evaluate the efficiency of water services in South Africa. So, we wanted to identify performing municipalities and provinces. We also want to identify plural performing municipalities and provinces, and this is where government intervention is required. And then to estimate financial losses due to inefficiency of service provision. And then we can use this to benchmark uh, the municipalities against each other. So let's jump right in. Uh, Senesolis in 2000 recommended that the variables like the inputs and outputs that are, should be used in any data envelope analysis for water service providers should come from these, um, this collection. He said that um, the operating expenditure should be your sole input because this is what we're trying to limit. We, want to, we don't want to overexpend, uh, overspend. And the outputs, outputs that can be used, obviously data dependent, our number of connections serves the length of man, number, the amount of water to clients, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, in South Africa, we've got a, especially in uh, public works, the data collection isn't always as great as it should be, and sometimes we can't find all these variables, but we found enough to be able to provide some interesting analyses. Um, for water services, the variables that we used were the input was operating expenditure as per the suggestion of Stanisolis, and the outputs were the system input volume, so how much water was delivered um, by each municipality or water service authority, the number of households that they served, and then uh, I suppose you, uh, a variable which um, it makes it a bit unique to South Africa in some ways is that it's, there are units uh, receiving free basic services in included as outputs. So the selection was made using what was what's called the efficiency contribution measure and that was proposed by Pasteur et al. in 2002. I'm not going to go into the technicality of it, but essentially it's a stepwise inclusion program or, or procedure such that a variable added stepwise fashion as, as the variable which contributes most to the change in efficiency scores is included. So we would start off, for example, operating expenditure and volume. These would be considered core variables because it's vital to the, the operating of the system. Then we can add different variables in, and whichever ones affect a change, a, a, the biggest change in the efficiencies are included in each subsequent step until none of the no more variables actually make significant change to the efficiency measures. All right, now we need to um, address the bias problem in uh, data envelope analysis. If we think about these observations, all fall within the production set, so they're, feas they're, they're feasible because they were observed and therefore they, they can exist. We would then imagine our production or somewhere on this side of our observed points. But the problem is our DEA puts a line over there. So the true efficiency is possibly the line segment between zero and the red line, or the red production function, rather than the DEA estimate of it at this point over here. So, what, so the problem comes in is that now we've got a higher estimate of efficiency for these ones. These are all considered to be fully efficient. And these ones are going to have higher or inflated efficiency because of the biasness of the construction. So we need to figure out a way around it. The one way around it, um, through the works of Seymour and Wilson from 1998 onwards, they propose a bootstrapping procedure to overcome this. So, 
Timor also developed this perspective. And so let's go through some maps on the estimation of or the use of this product or bootstrapping in this scenario. Once again, psi is going to be our production set, delta psi is our production frontier. Our sample of inputs and outputs Xn. Um, the DEA technique then goes and estimates our production set and our production frontier as psi hat and delta psi hat respectively. We now need to go and create D bootstrap samples. Um, and each sample will provide a set of efficiency estimates for the end firms. So each bootstrap sample will get a full set of efficiency estimates, and we can use that to correct for bias. However, the simple bootstrap technique won't work in frontier models. Uh, this technique cannot be used as it is necessarily inconsistent in terms of boundary estimation. This was shown by Simon. And this is overcome using a smoothing technique and this smoothing technique basically involves pseudo samples being a smooth non-parametric estimate of the kernel of the density of f of x y. Kernel density estimates are preferred, they're the most common, but the problem is that they are by of support. This was overcome firstly by transforming your traditional efficiency measure, which lies between zero and one and has two parts. Um, to, uh, what's called a shepherd's distance function, which is simply the inverse of the of the original theta, original efficiency estimate. This eliminates one boundary condition, and then reflecting these values around one, then eliminates both boundary conditions, and then the then the kernel density estimate is fitted or shaped on this on these observations, which have been. Um, inverted and reflected around one, and the boundaries of worth are subsequently eliminated using this technique. Um, if C1 Wilson then go on to explain if the distribution of efficiency is homogeneous over the input output space, the bootstrapping procedure is similar to that of a homeostatic regression model and is based on the residual. Essentially, the the inefficiencies that are observed, so the discrepancy between the frontier and the observed values, are treated as residuals, and and they're estimated in that way, and it reduces the bootstrapping to a univariate problem, which is much sim similar to work with. So instead of bootstrapping the x's and y's, we now just bootstrap our uh, delta, our, our inefficiency uh, measures. So the bootstrap sample is created in this way. The bootstrap sample is created first by projecting each of our x files onto the estimated frontier. And this is done by, in the, at least in the input orientation, by dividing each of the x asks, each of your inputs by its efficiency measure using the shepherd's distance function. Obviously, if you're using the traditional de Broglie Farrell measure of efficiency, you just multiply your x's by that value. You then project your, um, these ones that are now lying on the frontier, these observations, away from this measure randomly uh, by some value delta star. And that delta star is drawn from a smooth estimate of the, the density of delta, and you find a bootstrap pseudo, pseudo sample in that way. And so now you've got new x's on some value which is drawn from a smooth of the deltas, um, but your, your y's remain changed. You then can use go and find what the DEA estimates using this pseudo sample. The smooth estimates is found using univariate kernel density estimation which I've mentioned already. Graphically this is what, what happens is that we start off with the, the black dots here which represent our, our original observations. These ones are then projected onto the boundary. So these black, these black dots over here are already on the boundary. These ones are moved to the boundary. And then they're projected away to, to the points B, uh, to the blue points here. And these are this would be my, boost, my first bootstrap pseudo sample. And then I then go and find the efficiencies using that pseudo sample. So I create a frontier through those, and then I compare the blue dots to that efficiency, uh, to that frontier, and I get my efficiency estimate. Um, and then this is done um, 2,000 times 
10,000 times what is um, considered appropriate. A 2,000 is typical and was mentioned in the works of Seymour and Wilson. And then from that we can get some, some possibilities for inference. So using the bootstrap samples which have been created, you get efficiency estimates. Um, and are, these are then correct for bias and construct confidence intervals in this way. Um, this is now my bias corrected estimate. So we've correct for bias by subtracting the mean of the bootstraps and multiplying the original estimate by two. And then confidence intervals also can also be created for our efficiency estimates using this. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but this uh, formula over here where um, the C alpha, the C hat alpha over two and C hat one minus alpha over two are the empirical um, percentiles of this observed, dis uh, um, the distribution of this term, which is your, the difference between your bootstrap estimates and your original. And that's how bias is corrected for. These confidence intervals are bias corrected in that by nature. All right. So this is that's what we did. We went and we went and found some bias corrected estimates. We estimated, then corrected for bias, and then created confidence intervals. I'm not going to present all of the municipalities. I'll just give a summary of the municipalities by province. And as you can see, there are many provinces which um, which unfortunately couldn't report that in sufficient data to be included. And uh, sorry, many. Um, there are over 150 water service authorities in South Africa. We only had sufficient data for uh, 70 odd of them, and these, this is the breakdown. Um, we get metropolitan municipalities, urban municipalities, and rural municipalities. The urban municipalities or water service authorities are defined as municipalities in category B1 or B2. So B1 would be your secondary city and B2 would be the large towns. And then the rural would be category B3 and B4, so mainly rural towns, maybe some small towns in those, in those municipalities. The first thing we can notice is that the efficiencies are fairly high before bias correction, with the 80% efficiency observed in the Eastern Cape being the highest. The lowest performing um, uh, province in this case was the Northern Cape with the average efficiency estimate of 45%, which indicates that progress and um, improvements are possible. When the correct for bias it paints a much uh, leaker picture, again, the best performing municipality now is um, the Eastern Cape, but this is the bias correction has brought this down quite substantially because now it's only one percent better than the second base, which is on Popo, whereas beforehand was close to 7% superior. Again, the Northern Cape is the worst, and it, it perhaps provides a more accurate depiction of the work um, in order to improve our, our water service delivery. When we look at the, um, the efficiencies by municipality type, you can see the average Metropolitan municipality is actually fairly efficient, actually close to being um, highly efficient in that it's 89% efficient in the original estimation. Urbans are 55 and rurals are 59. As you can see, this is perhaps the, the area where our, our most concerted efforts can be made for improvement in our urban sector. The rules seem to outperform them in, on average. The bias corrected ones paint a similar picture over the adjustments make the efficiencies quite substantially lower, particularly for the, for the metropolitan municipalities. So the bias correction seems to be particularly strict on your larger municipalities. All right, so at the end of that, those results end in indicating at least for the for the water service authorities that were included in the assessment, is that 4.2 billion rand is being spent efficiently in the water service sector, and that was only for the 70 
seven municipalities that were included in the study. And, that's, and those account for 58% of the population. When we do a basic projection, a very basic projection, of how much this would cost for the entire country, you're looking at in the region of 7 billion being spent inefficiently in the water services sector. So there is some room for cost savings in the, in the water services sector. Next up is our electricity distribution study. Now this one wasn't conducted by me, this one was, this one was conducted by one of my master's students, Mr. Kwaka, and he um, assessed 170, uh, he, he assessed municipalities and their ability to distribute electricity to so the way it works in South Africa, we've got 177 municipalities that are licensed to supply power to consumers. Um, these municipalities purchase um, power in bulk from ESCOM and then sell it to consumers to raise, uh, to earn a profit at a raised cost. 50, uh, 20 to 50% of municipal total income is due to power sales, and this is a substantial chunk of the municipality's income, so it's, a, so it's a good thing to be assessed. So the objectives of this are to determine the cost efficiency with which municipalities distribute electricity and to supplement the literature regarding the efficiency analysis in electricity distribution. Uh, in the platform context. So what we did is used three models. We used the Cobb-Douglas model and the trans model as we discussed Previously, we also looked at a restricted model which was used in electricity uh, generation by Chris Christensen and Green in 1976. We then, the difference comes in is that now we um, input prices for the inputs. So that's uh, that when you're doing a cost function, you require input prices. And we looked at the cross sectional data for the year of 2005. And this is what the, the different models look like. So the cobb douglas is simply this um, equation over here. As you can see now, we can handle multiple outputs because um, we're looking at a, we're considering a cost function. And the hybrid model includes some of the interaction terms between the outputs. And the full translog model is this whole model over here. So it gets progressively bigger. Um, as each model, as the model changes. So cobb Davis restricted model and the full translog model is this entire equation over here. We decided the most appropriate um, functional form using the likelihood ratio test. Um, and I'll show you those results later. But before we can run those tests and find the distributions, we have to uh, find what our inputs and outputs were. So we had 121 municipalities see the number of municipalities is much higher in this case than it was for the, for the water services case, at least 50 more. And we, the problem, however, is that the most recent data that we could obtain from StatsSA was for the 2005 municipal year. At the moment, we're trying to um, source data from a more recent time. So we decided on two inputs and two, uh, two outputs and two inputs for the study. The outputs were the number of units sold and the number of uh, customers served, and the input prices, so the prices of the inputs would be the labor and the power, where labor is the total, num to total amount spent on wages and divided by the total number of employees, and the power is the cost of power divided by the total number of megawatts. All right. Um, I see that I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to move even quicker. The results of the likelihood ratio just indicated that the restricted model, so neither the cobb douglas nor the um, full translog was the most uh, appropriate, and so we went and used that restricted model over here, so this, this line over here. Um, once we've established the most appropriate model, what is the what is the most appropriate distribution for the inefficiency term? As I said, that's very subjective. It could be the half normal, exponential, or truncated normal, or gamma distribution, or wobble distribution. There are many. How do we decide which one it is? 
it was suggested that we use the view test, and we did that to decide these five distributions. The half normal, exponential, truncated normal, gamma, and Rayleigh distribution. The view test uses pointwise likelihood ratio, and the null hypothesis is that the two distributions that we are, that we are assuming, so F would be the distribution perhaps with the half normal, um, or the function with the half normal distribution for the error terms. G would be the function with perhaps the truncated normal um, distribution for the error terms, and we compare them in this way. And the ultimate hypothesis differs in that if your expected value here is significantly greater, then it will favor the F distribution, which would be your normal distribution for the error terms, and um, if it's less than order of favor, the G distribution. Um, it was shown that if we define the viewing statistic in this way, um, using the likelihood ratio and the standard deviation of that term LR, then we can show that that viewing test is converges in distribution to the standard normal distribution. And that leads us to rejection regions as follows. If V is greater than the 1 minus alpha over 2 um, percentile of the standard normal distribution, then we favor the F function. Um, if it's between negative 1.96 in our example and positive 1.96, then we will um, then we, then we don't have any evidence to suggest that either is preferred. And then if it's less than negative 1.96, then we favor the second distribution. The results are shown as follows. We actually got some inconclusive results, which made us unsure of which one to actually go for. As you can see, the exponential is preferred to the half normal in this case. The truncated normal is also preferred to the half normal and the gamma distribution is also preferred to the, preferred to the half normal. Um, so these ones are all better than the half normal, except for the Rayleigh, and the, Rayleigh is to the, to the, the half normal is preferred to the Rayleigh distribution in this case. When we compare the exponential and the truncated normal, it's inconclusive. The same thing goes for exponential and gamma, and the truncated normal and gamma. So we've got a whole bunch of inconclusive um, results. So it could be the exponential, the truncated normal, or the gamma when it comes down to it. And in order to identify one, we had to make a choice. We used the ARC in accordance with a study by Lorden where they, um, in 2007 where the ARC was used. And for the inconclusive ones, it's found that the distribution which minimizes the ARC is your gamma distribution and so the gamma distribution was selected as most appropriate. And this gave us some efficiencies. Now, the, as you can see, the prognosis for the electricity distribution is far better than the water services. As you can see, Gauteng is your most efficient, and um, least efficient is Mpumalanga, but that's still very efficient with the um, efficiency, average efficiency of 80%, and the average efficiency of 91% for Gauteng shows that, that we're pretty much on track. Um, and it shows small um, improvements can be made to improve the efficiency in the electricity services sector. But as I said, this was in 2005, and much has changed in our electricity uh, landscape in South Africa since then, what is the electricity crisis coming in after that, and mm, multiple times of load shedding. So we need, a, we need newer data to be able to make um, good estimates and current estimates of this. But this provides at least a manner by which we can do this. Uh, some additional extensions that we are investigating at the moment um, or have been uh, investigating in the past. The bootstrap procedures, um, we can now we can use the M out of N bootstrap, which can then eliminate the use for uh, kernel smoothing smoothing. Um, we can use the Malmquist Productivity Index, uh, and that will assess efficiency change over time. When you've got panel data or data observed over a number of years, you can determine how this efficiency changes, how the changes along with it. 
one of the big criticisms of DEA is that it's a very simplistic look at the uh, overall um, conditions and circumstances of, uh, of a municipality. If you use second stage DEA, we can then use, uh, we can then use regression methods to account for environmental factors and then adjust our efficiency estimates accordingly. And then we also need to re-look at the use of the viewing statistic in order to um, identify the most appropriate distributions for our inefficiency terms in the, in the stochastic frontier. We're busy doing that at the moment too. Um, that's me for today. Thank you for listening. I uh, went three minutes over time. My apologies for my references. For those of you who are interested, thank you very much.